I welcome you to the 2020 Candidates Forum presented by the Leagues of Women Voters of Bowling Green and the Parisburg area and BGSU Votes. Co-sponsors are the American Association for University Women, Bowling Green Chapter, and the Bowling Green Chamber of Commerce, and the BGSU Retirees Association. Many changes had to be made to this forum for our annual event because of COVID-19. We thank the Bowling Green University for allowing us to meet here in the ballroom, which gives us a space to be socially distant. And we are certainly socially distant, aren't we? <laughs> and of course, we're delighted that WBGU-TV is live streaming this forum and recording it for future access on our league websites. And I especially thank the team that organized this event, headed by Ellen Dalton, Deborah Gorman, and Paul Van Valdez. The union staff has asked us to, be, to observe their COVID requirements, which are social distancing, which we are doing, and wearing your mask at all the time you're in the building. And we ask you not to make audio or video recordings during the forum and to observe the League of Women Voters rules that the live stream tonight and the recording are to, viewed, to be viewed only in their entirety. The mission of the League of Women Voters is to promote political responsibility through informed and active participation in government and selected governmental issues. We are and have been for 100 years nonpartisan. It's no coincidence that the League and the 19th Amendment are both 100 years. The League this year, League was founded to inform that half of the population that would be voting for the first time. Not to tell them who to vote for, but to give them good information, truthful information, and unbiased information so that they would make their own choices. A venue such as a forum allows you, the voter, to answer the answers to your questions in the candidate's own words. Ordinarily, we would be circulating, picking up questions from you. Well, in these COVID, this COVID year, we cannot do that. So we asked for questions to be sent in to our website. They have been screened and we have, uh, our moderator will propose the questions. Uh, I assure you the candidates have not seen them in advance. Besides the forum, the leagues have a great deal of information for voters on the vote411.org website and for judicial candidates on the judicialvotescount.org website. Both are free and I think you will find a great deal of very useful information on them. My thanks to Joyce Kepke, Shar Shear, and Deb Gorman, who worked very hard for both Vote 411 and the Voters' Guides. Additional information can be found at both the Perrysburg and Bowling Green League's websites, and of course, the excellent website of the Wood County Board of Elections. Both leagues publish Voters' Guides in print and online. And in Bowling Green, we're very grateful to the Sentinel Tribune for printing our voters guide and making it widely available. Remember, registration for voting for the November 4th election ends tomorrow, October 5th. Early voting begins <coughs> Tuesday, October 6th. You can vote by mail or in person at the Wood County Courthouse Atrium. For those of you in the ballroom, please hold your applause until the end of the forum, and of course, refrain from any vocal responses. For many years, this forum was organized by League member Judy Knox, who passed away just recently. What we do here today is a tribute to her memory. We're so grateful for her legacy of fairness and efficiency. Our question screeners are Roger Anderson and Joyce Kepke, both from the Bowling Green League and Christy Vazazi and Carol Russell from the Perrysburg League. The timers 
in the middle are Sharon Hanna and Barbara Moses. And now I turn the microphone over to your moderator, Lee McLaird. Lee is secretary of the League of Women Voters of Ohio and the immediate past president of the Bowling Green League. Lee. Thank you. And thank you all for attending our candidate forum. We hope you find it enjoyable and informative. As this is our first time holding a virtual forum, I will briefly explain and review our process. Here's an outline of the timeline that we will follow. I will introduce all the candidates and read the biographies they have submitted. The questions for our forum were submitted in advance by citizens of Wood County and members of the League of Women Voters. The questions were then reviewed and selected by a committee of League of Women Voters members to avoid duplication and to choose appropriate questions for each office concerned. We anticipate two rounds of questions for each candidate. Each question asked for a particular office will be answered by both candidates. We have drawn names for the first speaking order. After that, we will um, alternate. As moderator, I will indicate who speaks first for each question. Each candidate will have one and a half minutes to answer a question. Our timers will be using a light box to indicate how much time remains to the speaker. The green light will be turned on to show the beginning of the response time. The yellow light comes on when there are 15 seconds remaining. The red light means stop. If time allows, after two rounds of questions, we will ask a few more questions for some of the offices, mostly for those that received the most interest from people who submitted questions. We will stop the questions at 8.30 to allow time for final statements. We will use the same speaking order that was used for the first round of questions. As moderator, I will indicate the first speaker and the speaker on deck and will continue to indicate each speaker in turn. Each candidate will have two minutes for their final statement. Once again, I want to thank you for coming this evening. Let's get started. The candidates for Wood County Recorder are not here this evening. Candidate James Matuzek did not want to sign the required media release form. According to League of Women Voters rules, if one candidate does not come, the other candidate may not appear either, so as to preserve the nonpartisan policy of the League of Women Voters. Thus, candidate Julie Baumgartner is not here either. Here are your candidate biographies. Candidates for 6th District Court of Appeals. Myron C. Duhart has been a general division judge in Lucas County since 2011 and has served as a commercial docket judge since 2016. He received a BA in political science from Wright State University and his JD from the University of Toledo College of Law. Judge Duhart also received an LLM in judicial studies from Duke University School of Law and has attended the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Prior to judicial service, Judge Duhart clerked for the Honorable Robert W. Penn and was in private practice. He is an Army veteran and served as a JAG officer in the United States Army. Charles Sulek is seeking the election to the Ohio 6th District Court of Appeals. Charlie is a litigation attorney at the law firm of Eastman and Smith Limited in Toledo, Ohio. He previously worked as a judicial attorney in the Ohio Supreme Court for retired Justice Terrell o Terrence O'Donnell. He also worked for the Committee on Agency Rule Review, JCARR, which is responsible for reviewing proposed rules from over 100 state agencies. He and his wife Emma reside in Sylvania Township with their children. The Sulik family enjoys spending time exploring Northwest Ohio, going to farmers markets, reading books, and playing sports in their backyard. Ohio Senate District 2. Teresa Gavarone was sworn into the Ohio Senate in 2019, having previously served in the Ohio House since 2016. She represents the people of Erie, Ottawa, Wood, Fulton, Part, and Lucas, Part, counties. 
Ms. Gavaron holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from Bowling Green State University and a law degree from the University of Toledo College of Law. In addition to her public service, Ms. Gavaron is an attorney and co-owner of Mr. Spot's Restaurant with her husband, Jim. They have three children and reside in Bowling Green where they attend St. Aloysius Catholic Church. Joel Odoricio is a proud father, professor, and labor leader. He grew up in Columbus, attending public schools his entire life. After graduating from OSU, he moved around the country, developing his trade as a glass blower and starting a small business. He moved back to Ohio 14 years ago after getting a teaching position at BGSU. Odoricio helped unionize BGSU in 2010, providing stability and security to faculty and staff. Today, he is running for state senate to strengthen public education, improve the lives of working people, and end government corruption. Scor Corey Spiewick is a native of Webster Township. He attended Eastwood Schools, graduated from St. John's Jesuit High School, received his bachelor's degree from Fordham University and his Juris Doctor degree from the University of Toledo Law School. He is running for Judge of Common Pleas Court. Corey is married to Jody, a nurse educator who chairs the nursing program at Lourdes University. They have three children, two of whom attend Eastwood schools, and the third attends preschool at St. John's Hilltop in Stony Ridge. Corey is an attorney with a diverse practice of law where he acts as prosecutor and helps clients with compl complex legal issues. Joel Kuhlman, Kuhlman is a lifelong Wood County resident. He graduated from Eastwood Local Schools and attended the University of Toledo where he received degrees in engineering and law. He lives in Perrysburg with his wife Gretchen and three daughters, Josie, Hollis, and Etta. For Ohio House District 8, candidate Haraz Gambari works for us in Columbus. Haraz and his wife, Kim, are the proud parents of Madison and Jackson, and Haraz is committed to policies that support public education. He promotes legislation that would transform our school funding system and provide funding for our schools to ensure our children's futures are bright. Haraz also has a proven record of partnering with law enforcement leaders to ensure our neighborhoods and schools have the necessary resources they need to keep safe. Haraz has nearly two decades of military service and currently serves as a lieutenant commander in the Navy Reserve. Laurel Johnson grew up in Wood County. She is from a working class family and graduated from Otsego High School at the height of the recession. A first generation college graduate, she transferred from Owens Community College to Kent State University, where she earned her bachelor's degree in communication studies. Laurel also studied state issues in Columbus and interned for State Senator Edna Brown. She now works as a medical marijuana dispensary agent, engaging with folks from across the state. Laurel's main legislative priorities are to strengthen public schools, expand access to health care, and protect envir the environment for future generations. For Wood County Sheriff, Mark Vasilishin is graduated from Rossford High School in 1979 and received a BA from Hillsdale College in 1983. He served with Perrysburg Police from 1990 to 2005 and has been Wood County Sheriff since 2005. He serves on the Board of Directors, Executive Committee, National Ser Sheriff's Association from 2012 to the present and was president of the Buckeye State Sheriff's Association in 2017. He has many other active memberships and has received awards and certificates. Ruth Babel Smith retired from Wood County Sheriff's Office after 25 years. She presently teaches the Peace Officer Training Program at Owens Community College education, uh, master's degree, criminal justice, police executive leadership college, doctoral candidate, leadership studies, awards, WCSO, certificates of appreciation, two, 
Certificate of Merit for Excellence in Duty, Memberships, Fraternal Order of Police, Lodge Number 109, Ohio Police Benevolent Association, National Association Women Law Enforcement Executives, Gold Key Honor Society, AMVETS Number 711 Auxiliary, Fraternal Order of Eagles Number 2180 Auxiliary, VFW 1148 Auxiliary, and Daughters of the American Revolution. Born in Toledo, she moved to Bowling Green nearly 40 years ago and lives with her husband, Wood County Commissioner. Bruce Jeffers grew up near Fostoria working on his father's tree nursery. He helped him develop the uh, patented Jeffersrud hybrid maple tree. He then attended the University of Toledo and Cornerstone University, earning degrees in math, education, religion, and sociology. He went on to teach high school for 35 years, mostly in Otsego. He was the chief uh, bargainer for many teacher contracts. Bruce spent the last eight years on the Bowling Green City Council chairing the planning and finance committees. Bruce is married to Amy with two grown sons, Mac and Sam. Ted Bolas was elected Wood County Commissioner in, in 2016. Dr. Bolas holds degree of Doctor of Podiatric Medicine from Kent State University and a master's degree in neuroscience and neuroanatomy from UTMC. He is a former Eastwood School board member a past president of the Wood County Board of Health and a former board member of Behavioral Connections. He has taught doctoral level neuroscience classes at the University of Findlay. Ted and his wife Lois live in rural Wood <coughs> County. They share a combined family of eight children and four grandchildren. U.S. House District 5. Nick Rubando grew up in Holland, Ohio, a working class town outside of Toledo. Politics became personal for Nick after he witnessed his mother's struggle to afford insurance after she developed a pre-existing condition. Nick began his political career while studying journalism at Indiana University. During the 08 Obama campaign, he worked as a student volunteer. Nick moved back to Ohio and immersed himself in local politics. He learned that corporate dark money had bought our representatives leading to pollution in Lake Erie, inaction on the opioid crisis, and renewed attacks on the middle class. That's when he decided to run. Bob Latta represents the people of the 5th District in the United States House of Representatives. He serves as the ranking Republican on the Energy and Commerce Committee's Communications and Technology Subcommittee. He has also served our region in the Ohio Senate, Ohio House of Representatives, and as a Wood County Commissioner. Bob graduated from the University of Toledo College of Law, Bowling Green State University, and Bowling Green Senior High School. He is married to Marcia, who was raised on a farm in Williams County, and is a university administrator. They have two daughters, Elizabeth and Maria. So, now we can get to the first round of questions. The first questions will come to will be in the order of the biographies that you just heard. Uh, first will be the 6th District Court of Appeals, um, candidates Myron Duhart and Charlie Sulek. Uh, first speaker will be Myron Duhart. Question, what forms of voluntary, professional, and community service have you been involved with, both in the past and currently? Well, first, uh, thank you for inviting me to the uh, League of Women Voters. Uh, community service has been a hallmark of my life and my career. I am of the opinion that those who have been given uh, great privilege also uh, is required to give back. And so I have been involved in a number of community organizations. First, I have certainly uh, served this country as a United States Army veteran, but secondly and more importantly, uh, I've been involved in a number of community uh, groups to include, uh, I presently sit on the Board of Directors for Mercy Health System, 
uh, as well as the uh, Salvation Army. Uh, I also sit on the Frederick Douglass Community Center. Uh, that is in uh, the uh, social services and social organizations. Uh, I also am very involved and committed to giving back to the legal community. I serve as the first vice president for the Toledo Bar Association and will become the president next year as well as the first vice president for the University of Toledo College of Law Board of Governors of which I'll become the president of that organization as well. I tell you those things because uh, to me that's a reflection of my commitment uh, not only to the legal profession but also to the community. I see the red light so I'm shutting up. <laughs> okay, uh, Charlie Sulek, uh, do you not need me to repeat the question? No, I'm good, thank okay. you. Just waiting on the timer, okay. Uh, yeah, my name is Charlie Sulik, uh, uh, running for uh, Court of Appeals judge. Uh, I, I think service is very important, obviously. That's, that's one of the reasons that I uh, am seeking this position. Uh, I, I'm involved with the Toledo Bar Association. I've been involved with the Federalist Society. Uh, my family and I are also parishioners at Christ the King Catholic Church. Uh, honestly, we're, we're pretty blessed. My family's blessed. We have three children. Uh, so a lot of my spare time is spent uh, with them right now, but one of the things that I want to do uh, as a parent is teach them how important it is to stand up and serve when you believe that you have something to offer the community, uh, and that's exactly why uh, I, I have chosen to do this now, uh, to continue to find ways to serve others, uh, to be a positive voice in the community, uh, and to make a positive impact in the community, uh, and that's what I intend to continue to do as, as my career progresses. Uh, I'm all, I don't have anything further on that one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next office will be Ohio Senate District 2. Candidates are Teresa Gavarone and Joel Odoricio. First speaker will be Teresa Gavarone. House Bill 6 was passed in 2019 to support two Ohio nuclear power plants with ratepayer money. This year, it has been alleged that the passage of this legislation involved questionable funding. What is your position on House Bill 6? Should it be retained, repealed, replaced? Explain. Thank you. Um, I'm State Senator Teresa Gavarone, and um, I serve the 2nd Senate District, which actually includes all of Ottawa County, where Davis Bessie is located. Um, House Bill 6 would allow Davis Bessie to stay open, which is a, a big priority for my district. We have uh, thousands of people employed at Davis Bessie. And that generates millions in tax dollars. Tax dollars that fund the schools, libraries, emergency services, and many other things throughout the district. On top of that, nuclear energy actually um, accounts for about 90% of Ohio's carbon-free energy. And clean energy is really important to my district. I served on Bowling Green City Council, part of a city council that uh, voted to um, bump up our renewable resources to 40% energy. So um, it's really important that uh, Davis Bessey stay open. If nuclear were to go away, that energy that's lost from nuclear would be taken up by, by coal and, and gas. So, um, and on top of that, the policy that left the House was very different than what the Senate passed. The Senate took an independent look at that legislation and made pages and pages and pages of changes. Changes included the annual audits and actually resulted in a net decrease in everyone's uh, energy bills. We also um, worked with community leaders. Thank you. Next speaker is Joel Odoricio. Uh, do you need me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay. House Bill 6 was passed in 2019 to support two Ohio nuclear <coughs> power plants with ratepayer money. This year, it has been alleged that the passage of this legislation involved questionable funding. <coughs> what is your position on House Bill 6? Should it be retained, repealed, replaced? Explain. Well, I'd, I'd like to first start by saying that 
Davis Bessie does in fact have important jobs in our community. Uh, but we can't accept $60 million of bribery and corruption as the normal cost of doing business in Ohio. Um, you know, since I've moved back to Ohio, the FBI has come through Ohio three times to clean up Republican corruption in Columbus. Uh, each time it gets worse than the time before, and I'm tired of paying a corruption tax uh, for the legislation that's going on in our state. So we've talked about the jobs that, that those plants provide in our community, but we also have to talk about the cost that that extra energy, uh, the extra fees that we're paying for our energy are costing across the state. So we're paying $300 million a year to subsidize these plants. That's being passed on to ratepayers. That's being passed on to manufacturers who then have to cut jobs themselves. So we can't prioritize some jobs over others. We can't prioritize uh, some, we can't pick winners, right? We have to allow companies to stand or fall on their own. And, um, you know, it has the additional cost of, um, it's crippled our renewable energy uh, portfolio here in Ohio. So we have to look at all of the costs of this bill and we have to repeal it and replace it with um, open legislation that's, that's uh, devised in the view of the public. Thank you. Okay, the next office is Judge of Common Pleas Court, candidates Corey Spiewick and Joel Kuhlman. First speaker is Corey Spiewick. What forms of voluntary professional and community service have you been involved with, both in the past and currently? Thank you. Uh, my name is Corey Spiewick, and I appreciate you having me here tonight. Uh, community service is a, a pretty important thing to me and to our profession. Professionally, and, and by community service, I mean things that are not paid for. Professionally, I've been a past president of the Wood County Bar Association, uh, past board member of the Wood County Bar Association. I currently sit as a committee chair at the Wood County Bar Association for new attorneys who want to take the bar exam. And I'm the past uh, director or chair of the Wood County Bar Association Committee on Attorney Grievances and Discipline. I also was a board member at the Morrison Waite Inns of Court, which is a professional organization for attorney ethics. <clears throat> Outside of the legal profession, I currently sit on the Wood County Adamus Board, which is the Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services Board. And we provide funding for uh, different agencies and programs within the county for those suffering from various uh, issues related to alcohol, drug addiction, and mental health. I also have uh, served and continue to serve as a board member of Alicia's Voice, which is a domestic violence advocacy group. And I was part of and continue to help the Eastwood Community Improvement Corporation, which is a Eastwood area uh, organization devoted to bringing and retaining business and success within the Eastwood community. Thank you. The next speaker is Joel Kuhlman. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, that's okay. Okay. Um, first, thanks for the League of Women Voters putting this event together. Um, I'm sure it was a challenge with the uh, new requirements that you had to uh, abide by, and thanks to the university for hosting. I think I saw President Rogers in the crowd someplace. Um, I am a, uh, what I would say is I'm an attorney at a small uh, law firm in Bowling Green, and we have an office in North Baltimore. Um, anybody that has ever worked in a small law office knows that most of the work you do is a community service, and it's not paid. Um, that's part of the job, and m many of the clients that we have that come in um, don't have the money to pay a retainer or pay a monthly rate, but they have a need that needs to be met. And me, uh, as one of those attorneys, but also the attorneys at my firm, um, have taken, uh, we, we totally take that responsibility seriously, and we have performed that responsibility um, over the last, since the 12 years that I've been there, but it started before that. Um, I'm a past, also a past member of the Eastwood Educational Foundation, uh, which is a group that manages uh, the uh, uh, scholarship funds for Eastwood students that are going on to college and skilled trades. Um, the 
recently, uh, my two brothers and a friend of ours, who's a police officer here at the university, started a program to raise money for uh, financially in need uh, students at Eastwood. Um, we were able to raise about $5,000 uh, last November, uh, and then going into the summer, we raised another 7000 to feed uh, kids whose parents were struggling with uh, employment. Okay, thank you. Um, the next office is Ohio House of Representatives, District 3. Candidates are Haraz Ganbari and Laurel Johnson. The Ohio Ed Choice Program allows taxpayers' money to be used to pay tuition to private and parochial schools. Given that taxes were voted on to fund public education, do you believe that Ed Choice is reasonable and or constitutional? Why or why not? First speaker will be Haraz Ganbari. Well, good evening and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to participate in your forum. Also, just want to say hello to my wife, Kim, and our kids, Maddie and Jack, who are watching on live TV. So thanks for the broadcast for that. You know, my wife is a school teacher. Uh, my wife's been teaching uh, since she graduated from uh, Kent State University. Uh, we previously uh, lived in Alexandria, Virginia, when I was in the White House Press Corps. And my wife taught uh, foreign languages at Fairfax County Schools. Now, as a parent, uh, both of our children are going through the school system right now. Our son is in a... Um, kindergarten readiness program and our daughter is in the second grade. You know, at the end of the day, I believe that we cannot allow one's uh, home or their circumstances to decide their fullest uh, learning potential. Uh, we have great schools uh, here in Wood County. Um, I'm very involved meeting with county superintendents. I've also had a lot of opportunity to uh, visit some of our private schools as well. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we cannot uh, necessarily be comparing um, apples to apples on some of these issues. Uh, for some people, we need to make sure that, you know, they have some uh, additional services that maybe a normal traditional education setting could not provide for them. So at the end of the day, you know, we need to let our parents decide what is the best uh, educational route for their students. And so I'm committed to continuing this dialogue and I look forward to uh, the rest of the forum this evening. Next speaker is Laurel Johnson. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please, if you could. Okay. The Ohio Ed Choice Program allows taxpayers' money to be used to pay tuition to private and parochial schools. Given that taxes are voted on to fund public education, do you believe that Ed Choice is reasonable and or constitutional? Why or why not? Um, thank you for posing that question and thanks for hosting this forum tonight. Um, my belief is that ed choice is not constitutional. Um, I believe that tax dollars from tax paying citizens should be spent for public goods and services that includes public education. Um, and when we take those funds and we allocate them to vouchers for certain students at public school or sorry at private schools um, that takes away funding from students who have education at public schools so those public dollars i believe should be spent specifically on public education if you would prefer your child to go to a private school that's where your private dollars should be spent i don't believe that public tax dollars should be spent on ed choice vouchers thank you uh, the next <coughs> Office is Wood County Sheriff. Candidates are Mark Vasilishin and Ruth Babel Smith. What do you think is the most important change that <coughs> needs to happen within the Sheriff's Department in order to decrease implicit bias and increase trust among minority communities in Wood County? First speaker is Mark Vasilishin. Thank you. I think it's vital that we have uh, transparency and accountability to the citizens and part of that is something that we have been doing since I've been sheriff. Uh, in 2006, which was my first budget year, we put dash cameras in all the cars. And again, accountability, visibility. We have GPS units in all of our cars to know where they are. And uh, we also have uh, body cameras. We were the first law enforcement entity in the region to have body cameras. We've had them since, uh, for, well, for the last seven years. We also... Uh, hire people that have the service mentality, that they understand that they work for the 130,000 people that live in Wood County. They are my boss and their bosses. 
And uh, it's very important that I am connected with the community. I go to all kinds of chicken dinners, Eagle Scout ceremonies, uh, township trustees meeting, village meetings, uh, wherever I'm invited, uh, public events, interacting with the people. And the more of that positive interaction we have, the better off we are, along with uh, more outreach we have where we're doing positive things for the people. For example, funeral escorts. We did 217 funeral escorts last year, mostly done by my volunteer auxiliary. We have shuttle carts at the fair, at uh, festivals in Pemberville, Lucky, Perrysburg, Bowling Green, vacation checks. We do uh, trunk or treat program, kids ID programs, uh, rad kids. Uh, we assist in safety town. We have an explorer post. We have an auxiliary. All these things are ways that we interact with the community in a positive way instead of just arresting. Thank you. The next speaker is Ruth Babel Smith. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, that is not necessary. Thank you. Uh, thank you for hosting this event and thank everybody for coming this evening. Uh, law enforcement has really uh, been getting some negative press lately. And part of that is due to the fact that several officers have lost sight of what their duty is, what their responsibilities are. As sheriff, I would encourage total transparency with the citizens of Wood County. I would make sure policies and procedures were available for viewing on the website. I would make sure that press releases would be released in a timely, quick manner so that other stories don't begin to circulate. I would invite the public to come in and be a part of our hirings, of our promotion boards. I would also sit down with the community leaders, the community groups, to have the open conversations that need to happen so that we understand where these groups sit and they also understand the job that we need to do in law enforcement. There has to be a mutual communication across that table. My stance is always public safety. In order to achieve that, there has to be communication. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The next office is Wood County Commissioner. The candidates are Bruce Jeffers and Ted Bolas. The question is, what are the most significant problems facing Wood County in the next four years, and how will you address them? First speaker, Bruce Jeffers. Thank you for the question, and thank you for all your efforts. Wood County has um, a lot of economic development issues to deal with. People have often, I've often heard them say when I was a councilman for Bowling Green for eight years that growth is good. And I like to say growth is neutral. It might be good, but we gotta make sure we're counting all the costs. In my time in Bowling Green City Council, we were able to develop our economy by growing 42%. At the same time, we installed the state's largest solar field. So we were progressive while being careful with our budget. Being careful with the budget in Bowling Green has allowed the city to be in a fairly decent position in the middle of this COVID crisis. And uh, <clears throat> to go along with this as we develop economically in a smart way, we need to make sure that when we make deals with companies to come into Wood County, that we're not getting the short end of the stick. We need to make sure that they are covering the cost if they're going to get 15, 20 years of tax abatements, are all of us going to be stuck taking care of the infrastructure. So we need to make sure that our economic development going forward is done smartly. Thank you. Uh, the next candidate to speak will be Ted Bolas. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay. What are the most significant problems facing Wood County in the next four years, and how will you address them? Well, there, <clears throat> there are many uh, important issues that we face. And uh, the most recent, of course, is the COVID endemic that we're facing. So what we are doing about the uh, epidemic now, and we can depend on another endemic 
happening in the future, whether it be the COVID or another virus uh, that has mutated. So what we have developed or in the process of developing is what's called focus on the future because you readily see what has happened uh, to our economy and to our people medically. So the focus on the future purpose is to mitigate the economic impact that it, this COVID has had and also mitigate the medical problems that this COVID has had. So that's one of our priorities. Of course, the other priority is economic development. Everything develops around the economic development that we have. Economic development is directly related to the infrastructure. It's related to the uh, police force, the, the sheriffs, uh, and what they request to improve their department. It's related to everything we do. So, the, and I want to tell you this. Oh, <laughs> I need, can I have five more minutes? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, and the last office on the first round is the U.S. House of Representatives, District 5. Candidates Nick Rubando and Bob Latta. Question, how will you expand and improve health care coverage for Americans? First respondent is Nick Rubando. All right, well, thank you all so much. I, I truly appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here, and I appreciate uh, Congressman Latta for showing up because uh, until Last night at about 6 p.m., we were not aware if we could be here. And, um, you know, unlike Representative Latta, we actually appreciate the opportunity to speak with our constituents. And health care is extremely important. And right now, Congressman Latta and the Republican Party are trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act. There are nearly 300,000 Ohioans in the 5th District that have a pre-existing condition. If the, if the Affordable Care Act is repealed, those 300,000 Ohioans could be kicked off of their health insurance in the middle of a pandemic. This is what it's at stake. We are ensuring that we can have health care coverage as a human right. We want to get away with uh, co-pays and premiums, and we want to drastically drive down the cost of prescription drugs, and we can do that with a single-payer health care system. I want to ensure that we can expand health care rights. My opponent wants to rip them away. Thank you. Next, next speaker will be Bob Latta. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, thanks very much. And uh, first, let me thank the League for ha hosting this tonight. Greatly appreciate it. Also, I also want to express uh, my sympathy to uh, the Knox family. Uh, Judy was a tremendous part of the League for so many years. And in fact, I uh, knew them for a long time because I had uh, Dr. Knox, her husband, for five of my courses here at Bowling Green State <laughs> University. If you look at the single payer, you know, let me back up for a second. Uh, unfortunately, this is the first time I've ever met my opponent, so I, I really don't know him. But I just have to explain to him that we do have rules in the House. And the rule is, is that the, when the Speaker of the House represent, which I uh, explained to the uh, uh, Ellen and the rest of the folks here, we're under a 24-hour notice. If we have a 24-hour notice, that means I've got to be back in Washington. If I can't get a plane, I'm driving. So it's important that, uh, you know, I explain to people because I don't want people to think I'm going to be someplace and then all of a sudden not be there. So, it's important that uh, I always make sure I fulfill my commitments, which I've always done to this county and this district. Single payer, which the Democrats want to do, will cost 150 million Americans their health care today. 150 million Americans will be thrown off their health care. We want to make sure that we have uh, a patient-centered. We want to make sure that the uh, folks out there have increased care, that it's, uh, they have choice. We also want to improve that quality. And the other thing that's really happening out there today is we want to make sure on the telehealth side, which I've been very active with and also have legislation there today, but on, when it comes to making sure that uh, we uh, make sure that people that, that have pre-existing conditions uh, may, can have uh, their insurance, we have voted for it. We're going to keep, make sure that people with pre-existing conditions keep it. Thank you. Okay, that was the end of the first round. 
Second round of questions begins once again with the 6th District Court of Appeals, candidates Charlie Sulik and Myron Duhart. Question is, how do you prepare yourself to handle cases involving unfamiliar areas of the law? First speaker will be Charlie Sulik. Well, I, I think the way that the best way that you can prepare yourself and the, is by the experience I've already had, which is working at a place like the Ohio Supreme Court as a judicial attorney. Uh, that that court hears a variety of civil cases, criminal cases, death penalty cases, and when I worked at the court, uh, my former boss allowed me the opportunity to uh, advise him on all of those cases, assist him in the drafting of his opinions in those cases, and I uh, was able to take the experience that I learned there to my current position as an associate attorney at the uh, law firm of Eastman and Smith, where again I continue to work on uh, a variety in a variety of uh, areas of the law, primarily civil litigation, uh, professional malpractice, construction law, land use litigation. So I think uh, the experiences that I have have well prepared me to uh, be a judge on the Court of Appeals, which again deals with uh, a variety of areas of the law, uh, and will uh, really help me when there's a complex novel legal issue. Uh, I have the experience to adapt and, and, and handle those cases as well. Uh, thanks. Thank you. The next speaker will be Myron Duhart. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, thank you. How do you prepare yourself to handle cases involving unfamiliar areas of the law? Well, I have been a judge in the Lucas County Common Pleas Court General Division for close to a decade now. and. Uh, Although this may surprise you, there are multiple uh, times in which there are cases that come in front of me that are uh, new and novel legal issues. The best way, I believe, to, to, to be prepared for those experiences uh, is to train yourself to be open and receptive to the arguments of counsel. Um, during my time on the Common Pleas Court, uh, I've handled a wide range of cases to include multi-million dollar cases on the civil end all the way over to the uh, death penalty cases on the criminal side. And so uh, experience is critical, uh, education is critical, and the time and the commitment to uh, making sure that you are fully vested and uh, um, up to speed as to what the law is and what the issues are in that particular case. And so um, preparation is key. Uh, as a lawyer, I practiced law for close to uh, 20 years as well. I had a wide range of practice areas. Uh, and during that time, I also uh, had the opportunity to uh, gain a great deal of experience and expertise. And so. Um, those two things, I believe, are critically important in preparing for a case that comes in front of you uh, that the subject area may be new or different. Thank you. Thank you. The next office is Ohio Senate District 2, candidates Joel Odoricio and Teresa Gavaron. Question is, how would you implement a constitutionally compliant school funding system? Um, Joel Odoricio will speak first. Well, we've known for 20 years that the current way we fund our schools is not compliant with our Constitution. Uh, right now, somebody's zip code determines how much they can afford to spend on their schools, and that should not be the case. We know about how much it costs to educate each child here in Ohio. We need to make sure that as a state, we're distributing that, fun that funding fairly across the state. So there's a, a bill in the House right now, the Cup Patterson bill. I believe it may be moving towards a vote right now. It takes some steps in the right direction. Uh, I don't think it goes quite far enough. I'd like, to make, I'd like to see a system that makes sure that every child in Ohio has a fair chance at a quality education. Really, our education is an investment in the future of our state. We know that businesses don't move to states for lower taxes. They move to a state because there's a qualified workforce. Our education system is what determines whether we have qualified workers here in Ohio. We used to be a manufacturing center for the world, and we can be again. But those jobs aren't the same as they used to be. 
A manufacturing job now is maybe learning how to run a robot rather than uh, learning how to weld. So we're never gonna, we're always gonna need those solid trade jobs, but we also need uh, students to be trained for jobs of the future. Thank you. The next speaker is Teresa Gavaron. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. <clears throat> How would you implement a constitutionally compliant school funding system? Thank you. Education uh, must be among our highest priorities. As a mother of three kids who all went through Bowling Green City Schools, um, I was fortunate to be able to volunteer in the classroom and, and see all the good work that our teachers do. And we need to make sure our teachers have the resources to provide a quality education that our kids and families deserve. Um, since I've been in the General Assembly, we have increased school funding by millions of dollars. Um, we recently, um, in the last budget, passed uh, $675 million to our school districts uh, for wraparound services and wellness services. But uh, we're working on the funding formula. There is a piece of legislation that's going through the House right now. And um, it's important that we look at the best ways to, to fund our schools, to provide those resources for our kids. But um, in addition to, to funding, we also you know, have other work to do. We need to reduce mandated testing and making sure that the education we're providing um, sets our kids up for the next step, whether it's the workforce or college, and that we're providing an education that fits those uh, workforce needs. Thank you. Thank you. The next office is for the Judge of Common Pleas Court, uh, candidates Joel Kuhlman and Corey Spivak. What factors are considered in granting and setting bail for defendants? What do you believe is the primary consideration? First speaker, Joel Kuhlman. Uh, I think the primary consideration is, is the person violent. Um, how has their uh, activity negatively impacted the community and uh, violence is their first priority because um, all of us hope and expect um, to have a safe uh, community to uh, inhabit and go to work and raise a family um, and that should be given the most consideration. Uh, I think that there are some uh, ways that we can uh, develop that in Wood County in the court system. Um, we have three excellent judges, uh, and the judge that either Corey I or I will replace um, has vast experience in um, the crim uh, criminal law uh, sector, uh, and I think that um, some new concepts could be brought in uh, and that we can uh, help uh, to reduce the caseload at going through the court system, um, but also reduce the need for um, uh, the capacity uh, requirements of housing so many inmates. Okay. Uh, the next speaker is Corey Spiewick. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. What factors are considered in granting and setting bail for defendants? What do you believe is the primary consideration? Thank you. The, uh, the issue of bail is, is a pretty hot topic right now in, in the legal community. Fortunately, there are rules that have been promulgated by our Supreme Court in Ohio that guide judges in setting bail. Uh, part of that is recidivism or the likeliness of someone to reoffend. Another thing to consider is the safety of the community and the victims when setting bail. Uh, you also need to balance that with the financial needs and availability of the defendant. And uh, of course, you also have to consider their likeliness to return to court. So bail isn't designed to punish someone. Remember that uh, when someone's accused of a crime, they're not guilty until they're found guilty by a jury of their peers or a judge. But it's to ensure the safety of the community, the likeliness to return to court. And uh, also, we passed a, a constitutional amendment a few years ago in Ohio that uh, requires, Marcy's Law, that requires victims' participation in all phases, or at least the opportunity to participate in all phases of a criminal trial. So the victim's needs and input also needs to be considered. Uh, as a prosecutor, I regularly deal with bail and, and requesting bail from judges, and I look at all of those factors when I request the amounts of bail. Of course, the judge is the one that ultimately makes that decision. 
Thank you. Uh, the next office is Ohio House of Representatives, District 3. The candidates are Laurel Johnson and Haraz Ganbari. The question is, what is your position on House Bill 6, which is legislation passed in 2019 to support two Ohio nuclear power plants with ratepayer money and re remove incentives for renewable energy projects? Will you support legislation providing incentives to expand the renewable resource industry, including retraining current workers for thousands of new jobs? First speaker will be Laurel Johnson. Thank you. Um, first off, yes, I do support legislation that would promote um, industries in green energy, um, regulations on green energy standards that House Bill 6 rolled back, or rolled back, yeah. Um, the, the bribery scandal aside, um, when House Bill 6 was passed, I did not believe that it was good policy. Um, in general, I, I agree with the position that um, letting industries that are dying die out um, Clean energy is the way of the future. We absolutely have to invest in clean energy at whatever cost. Um, we, we should and very well could retrain people that work in those industries to work in the new industries of green energy. Um, and our state should, in my opinion, be using taxpayer dollars to bail out um, corporations to the tune of $1.1 billion over the course of the next few years, um, we could be investing that money in clean energy industries um, all across the board, investing in new jobs that it'll create across the board as well. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Haraz Ganbari. Would you like me to repeat the question? Thank you for the question. So HB6, the allegations surrounding HB6 were quite concerning to me. That's why we took uh, decisive action to remove Speaker Larry Householder from his role as Speaker at that time. To what Mr. Uh, Spiewick was saying earlier though, uh, a person that has charges brought to them, uh, they will be found guilty by a jury of their peers or by a judge. The other thing that I think is important to underscore, which was not reported at all uh, early on in the uh, news reports, is that we did not remove Larry Householder from the Ohio House of Representatives simply because uh, at this time, you can only be charged uh, one time and removed for one act. So if he, we remove him now and he wins in November, he will be back in January and we cannot remove him then. As far as the complexities of HB6, what I would say is that I went out to Davis Bessie, I toured their facility, I met with their workers, I've met with their communities, uh, but more importantly, I met with the, the communities here in Wood County as well, which included Bowling Green, Dick Edwards. We had some conversations to what Senator Gabrielle said earlier about how legislation uh, works between the House and the Senate. So the House put forth uh, recommendations. The Senate offered some amendments. I met with Mayor Edwards. Uh, he understood why those were in there. I would also say, though, that as a military officer, the analogy I would give you is that we cannot simply shut down nuclear power, mothball it, and bring it back later. So look no further than Cleveland and Youngstown to see what happens when you let industries just die. It depresses the entire community, the state, and the nation. Thank you. Uh, the next office uh, will be Wood County Sheriff. Uh, speakers will be Ruth Babelsmith and Mark Vassilution. Uh, question is, how will you ensure proper training, evaluation, and accountability of the Sheriff's Department employees, particularly those on the front lines of emergencies and difficult calls, such as mental health issues and domestic violence. The first speaker will be Ruth Babelsmith. The backbone of uh, any training program is good trainers. So first priority would be to ensure that the people who are doing the training are actually able to do that training, that they are either certified to do that training or they are authorities in their field. Ensuring the good training, then the officers will learn the proper procedures to be able to do their jobs, to be able to act on the front lines. In addition, I would also incorporate 
communication with authorities in the mental health field to step in and evaluate the training to make sure that it is appropriate, that it is, e that it is effective. Invite those mental health professionals to participate in crisis situations at the same time maintaining their safety while doing so. The mental health population is, I don't want to say victimized with criminal activity, uh, but they do end up in tedious positions at time due to the nature of their disability. Acting with individuals from the mental health area with these disabilities is a challenge and not just anybody can walk in there and resolve the situation. It takes people who are highly skilled and highly trained. I would ensure that the officers with the sheriff's office receive that training so that they can act appropriately to resolve these situations. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Mark Vassilation. Uh, would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, I'm good, thank you. Uh, it really does come down to accountability and transparency in what we do. And as we mentioned, uh, body cameras, dash cameras uh, in the jail, we have 130 cameras, all of which record. When I took office, they did not record. Uh, we even record audio where we are allowed to uh, record those. Uh, the state, the governor uh, came out with uh, a board called the Ohio Collaborative of recommendations for law enforcement in the state of Ohio to try to meet that. We, from the very beginning, have met that. We are on 100% compliance with all of the state re uh, recommendations for law enforcement, and we have been on that from the very beginning, which deals on pursuit policies, use of force policies, and uh, we meet or exceed all those qualifications. All of my deputies, whether they're road deputies or working in the jail, they all have to take critical incident training, and that really uh, started out with the Adamus Board working in partnership with them on de-escalation and recognizing different mental health issues and how to best deal with people that are in a mental crisis. And this same skills work with other people that are in stressful situations. Obviously, we get called, called to people when they're having some of the worst things, whatever happened in their lives, whether it's a domestic situation or other, other serious issues. And the CIT training carries over to that. Uh, we use Lexapol, which is a nationally recognized policy and procedure uh, program. And it's uh, customized for each agency, but they give guidelines and legal recommendations on those along with the prosecutor. But all of our policies and procedures are available to every deputy on their smartphone, on their MDT, in their vehicles, or in their office. It's electronic. It's li they're living documents. They change as things happen. And uh, we also really do a lot of time and energy and training. We have uh, significantly increased our training budget to make sure we have well-qualified, well-trained deputies. And the key, again, is hiring people who are of a service mentality and reminding all of our deputies we work for the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next office will be Wood County Commissioner, candidates Ted Bolas and Bruce Jeffers. The question is, given the large geographic area of Wood County, how can you promote communication between yourself and the citizens? Okay, thank you for that question. That's a very important question because I consider communication very important, especially with the emergency situations that we've been exposed to over the last six months. Um, what we established in the uh, commissioner's office is a conference call. Um, however, there are options of Zoom and WebEx, but we used the conference call so we could include a lot of people. And um, so we had people like Ben Beatty and uh, Jeff Klein. Ben Beatty was the health commissioner. Ben, or, uh, Jeff Klein is the emergency man management agency, and we had invited mayors, uh, township trustees, public, and of course the commissioners were there. So um, that uh, communication was very important. Um, 
The other thing that's important is how do we improve with what we did? Um, we learned a lot from this virus. This virus was what's called a novel in virus. It's a new in virus with mutations. The question is how to handle it. We learned a lot from our past experience and uh, we can utilize that um, in our new program that we're I'm developing. It's called uh, Focus on the Future. And with this program, we can hopefully mitigate the effect that it has on the economy and on the medical um, uh, effect on the people. So uh, you have to balance both. And that's what we did, that's what I did, that's why I asked the questions, that's why I attended uh, Open Up Now, to find out what they were thinking. Um, we have to find out both sides of the issue, and that's very important for this severe virus that we had. We don't want to go, th does that mean I'm out of here? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay I'm you. sorry, but. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker will be Bruce Jeffers. Do you want me to repeat the question? No, that's okay. That's a really interesting question. What the commissioners can do in communicating with the whole county is make sure that we're speaking with a clear voice. And we have to think right now about what we've done with the COVID pandemic. And, you know, we can, it's, it's good to have the conference calls, it's good to have the health department involved. But when our governor, when Health Commissioner Amy Acton, Local Health Commissioner Ben Beatty are saying we have to take strict measures, we have to follow very certain protocols to give us a chance to, uh, uh, to fight the virus, we need commissioners that are going to be on board with all of that. Um, I really don't understand why Ted went to an open Ohio Now rally in early May we were having a hard time getting everybody to comply with what we needed. We needed to be very careful if we wanted to get our restaurants back open, if we wanted to get our schools to open up. And I just don't understand that, that mixed message there. So I think that uh, commissioners have a great platform to help explain to uh, residents of Wood County what we're trying to accomplish, what citizens can do to make things better, and we just need uh, to support the experts in this issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And the next office is U.S. House of Representatives, District 5, candidates Bob Latta and Nick Rubando. The question is, the United States has fared worse during the COVID-19 pandemic than any other developed country. If you are elected to Congress, what national measures would you propose to help reduce COVID's impact on the American people. First speaker will be Bob Latta. Well, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't be in this situation today unless the Chinese would have told us what was going on. Uh, if the Chinese would have acted and closed their borders and let the rest of the world know, we could have got this thing under control quickly. But unfortunately, they didn't. But here in the United States, you know, we've passed four different pieces of legislation. Uh, we want to make sure on the therapeutic and the diagnostic side, that was an eight, over an $8 billion piece of legislation. We also passed uh, about another $100 billion, and then it was the, the CARES Act, which is $2.2 trillion, and then we passed another piece of legislation. But it really comes down to making sure that we get a vaccine out there. Serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, about two months ago, we had FDA, NIH, CDC, and HHS before us. And Dr. Fauci, is, you know, when he was testifying, was very confident that we would have by the end of this year, maybe into the first quarter of next year, that we would have a vaccine. And so that's very important. I know when I did a call with the Surgeon General, with uh, physicians and other healthcare providers in our district, uh, it was about a, a little over a month ago that uh, they were very confident that uh, we could even have something before uh, Christmas. So, you know, we wanna make sure. But uh, one of the issues that we had was that uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the Ch communist Chinese went out across the world and started buying the personal protection equipment before anybody else could get it. 
So uh, we've seen great strides here across the country with our PPP, PPE. Uh, right here in Northwest Ohio, it's been phenomenal. What I've seen is like in Paulding County, companies switched over to making uh, plexiglass, then they were told they probably couldn't be able to do it, but they did it. We've got companies that have switched over to make sure that they can make uh, protective gear for first responders and their doctors. A uh, company in Finley making N99 masks, amazing what they've been able to do in such a short period of time. company over in Defiance making N95. So we want to make sure that we do everything possible and we will keep doing it and make sure Americans are safe. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Nick Rubando. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. The United States has fared worse during the COVID-19 pandemic than any other developed country. If you are elected to Congress, what national measures would you propose to help reduce COVID's impact on the American people? Yeah, I appreciate you asking this question because it is extremely serious. I mean, there's over 200,000 Americans who have died, and I really think that this comes from the top down. I mean, we've all heard the tapes that Donald Trump knew that this was a serious virus back in March. Uh, I'm not sure when Congress was aware of this fact, but uh, we had representatives who were downplaying this virus to the American people, saying that, oh, don't panic. Well, look what that has done to us. So we need to ensure that we have representation and we have leaders that are actually telling the truth. And that is what we need to do. And we also need to ensure that we're protecting our health insurance. I, I think it's crazy that we have uh, a Supreme Court right now trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act in the middle of a pandemic. So we need to ensure that we're protecting our health insurance and also building our economy. We need to have a plan to focus on our economy. We have almost a million Ohioans who are unemployed right now and we have no plan for our economic success. We need to invest in infrastructure spending. We need to ensure that we are building a better tomorrow by investing in alternative energy so that when we come out of this, we can come out of this stronger with new green jobs. That's why we have a plan to create 25 million jobs with no new debt and no new taxes. Thank you. Thank you. I am told we have enough time to begin a third round of questions. Uh, these will not cover all of the seats that are up for uh, election, but the ones that we had uh, very good questions for. So the first one we will start with is Ohio Senate District 2, candidates Teresa Gavarone and Joel Odoricio. Question is, Ohio continues to waste money on voluntary incentives instead of improve, imposing new restrictions on big agriculture. Would you support EPA developing a set of meaningful and enforceable regulations to stop the over-application of manure on fields in Western Lake Erie Basin? Uh, first speaker will be Teresa Gavarone. Thank you. Um, Lake Erie is uh, one of Ohio's greatest resources, if not the greatest resource. And it's extremely important, not just to the second Senate district, but to the state as a whole, in terms of clean drinking water, recreation, and what it means in tourism. We have put a lot of money um, through the H2 Ohio program, which I was happy to co-sponsor, um, legislation that uh, allocated resources that will encourage be best practices the best way to really work on this problem is to bring people to the table, bring groups together, the scientists, the agricultural community, and the environmentalists, and have a conversation and work on solutions that will really have a lasting impact. I actually sponsored Senate Joint Resolution 1 that would create, create a bond fund that would create uh, 10 years, a billion dollars over a 10 year period to continue um, research and working on finding solutions that will have lasting impact to preserve this uh, asset for generations to come. I also serve on the Great Lakes Legislative Caucus um, Task Force, and we've been working with uh, le legislative leaders from every state that borders one of the Great Lakes, including Canada, to, um, to learn from each other what's working and what we can do to find um, real solutions. And it, it's extremely important that we find these solutions and really do what we can to preserve that asset. 
Thank you. The next speaker will be Joel Odorizio. Um, would you like me to read the question again? Yes, please. Ohio continues to waste money on voluntary incentives instead of imposing new restrictions on big agriculture. Would you support EPA developing a set of meaningful and enforceable regulations to stop the over-application of manure on fields in the Western Lake Erie Basin? I would support the development of EPA policies. And, uh, you know, uh, agriculture is one of the largest industries in Ohio. And um, it's not the same as, as it was in the past. My grandfather had a, a dairy farm and he had 40 or 50 cows. And he raised his whole family, on, my mom and all of her brothers and sisters, with 200 acres and 50 cows. Now a family farm is closer to 2,000 acres. Um, my uncle has a dairy farm and he's got 200 cows now. And that's a small farm. So what we're really talking about is industrial agriculture, 5,000 head of cattle, uh, 10,000 head of cattle. That's a small city, and we're allowing them to um, not treat that waste. We, we can't do that. The lake is the source of our community. It, it's the heart of our community. We depend on that for tourism. Uh, we depend on that for the fisheries. We depend on that for drinking water in many of the communities across our, our district. So we faced a similar problem in the 70s, right? We had uh, corp like industrial companies dumping PCBs into the water, and we had silt runoff from the farms that was choking the oxygen out of our lake. So we used a combination of uh, incentives and um, requirements to stop the dumping of PCBs, like reduce the silt runoff, and restore our lake. So we need the same system uh, of incentives and uh, regulation to make sure that we ha protect our lake and our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next office will be Ohio House of Representatives, District 3, candidates Haraz Ganbari and Laurel Johnson. The question is, what will you do to combat gerrymandering and ensure that voter-approved redistricting reforms are implemented? First speaker will be Haraz Ganbari. Thank you for the question. Here in Ohio, I have the full faith and confidence in our Secretary of State, Frank LaRose, to make sure that we have safe and secure elections. We have multiple ways to, to vote here in Ohio. You know, when it comes to the uh, concept of redistricting, you know, we are the only country anywhere in the world whose constitution begins with the words, we the people. And we takes two. So that's why it's important that we have dialogue and, you know, Throughout my, my tenure as a uh, state representative and also when I was on city council, that involved going out on a listening and learning tours. I've spent about five to 10 miles a day uh, walking throughout Wood County to meet directly with voters to hear their concerns. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we need to make sure that we continue to have uh, fair elections. Uh, we need to make sure that as uh, district lines are drawn, that it is representative of you know, our communities and those folks that we represent. And so again, at the end of the day, I, I uh, encourage everyone to make sure that they do get out and vote. As a uh, military veteran with almost two decades of service, I've been to about 30 countries around the world, uh, both uh, as a military officer and enlisted army soldier, member of the White House Press Corps. Uh, what I will tell you is we have a political process unlike any other in the world. And no matter what happens on the evening news and how much it might be frustrating from time to time, there is no other country in this world that I rather wake up and go to bed every night than the United States of America. Thank you. The next speaker is Laurel Johnson. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. What will you do to combat gerrymandering and ensure that voter approved redistricting reforms are implemented? Well, there's definitely no question that gerrymandering is a huge problem in the state of Ohio, both at the state level and at the federal level. Um, Ohio is not as red as it has been drawn to be, both at the federal level and state level. If you look at recent elections, the way that the popular vote has worked out, um, it's nearly 50-50 between Democrats and Republicans, both for federal races and state races. Um, but if you look at how those seats have been distributed for state races, um, it's been about two-thirds 
gone to Republicans. Um, and for federal, federal seats, it's been um, closer to three-fourths, um, which is not representative of how people are actively voting in the state of Ohio. Um, and so what I would do to uh, support fair redist redistricting um, would be to support a nonpartisan group um, to redraw those maps when those districts are up for being redrawn um, and ensuring that these districts are drawn fairly um, and without partisan um, preference, I guess you'd say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next office will be U.S. House of Representatives, District 5, candidates Nick Rubando and Bob Latta. If you are elected, do you commit to holding in-person town hall type meetings with your constituents regularly? Why or why not? Even during this current virus, you could use a format similar to tonight's candidate forum. First speaker will be Nick Rubando. Yes, I 100% commit to having in-person town halls. And this is something that I hear all the time when I go out into the district. And it's one of the reasons that I decided to run is because I think that our okay. representatives should be um, accountable to the people. This is starting. And the only way that we can have our representatives be accountable to the people is to ensure that they hold in-person town halls and that they take questions from their actual constituents. And that is what has been lacking in this district year after year after year. And that is why, of course, I commit to in-person town halls. And I hope that every single representative would commit to that and have them year after year, because that's what the bedrock of our democracy is built upon, is having representatives for and of the people. <laughs> so yes, to answer that question, yes, of course. OK. Uh, and Bob Latta, yeah, would, would you, you like me to repeat the question? Sure I heard all, all the parts of the question there. If you are elected, do you commit to holding in-person town hall type meetings with your constituents regularly. Why or why not? Even during this current virus, you could use a format similar to tonight's candidate forum. Well, thanks very much. And I've been uh, very fortunate over the uh, time I've been in office to be able to go, go across the, my current district and also the district I had before with my counties to the east. And that uh, we've been holding what we call courthouse conferences. And what that is is an opportunity for each constituent to come in and have a dialogue with me. And during those dialogues, we can open up a uh, casework forum, or if they just wanna talk about what they think's happening across the country or across the globe. And so I've done 130 of those courthouse conferences uh, to date. We've also done uh, four, uh, court, uh, not courthouse conferences, but we've actually done uh, uh, a um, uh, open forum for uh, veterans across the district on several occasions because that's very important to hear because again that's uh, it's in some cases how we come up with the uh, uh, bills that we have. I think it's important that uh, what we do with the courthouse conference because we don't set a time limit. We don't leave. I know the longest one I ever did was six hours. I sat in the same chair and never got up. Why? Because we had so many people. And I'll never forget uh, it was over in Van Wert in my first term. And I remember it was 4.30, we're doing it at the uh, commissioners. And uh, someone came in and said, uh, hey, it's 4.30, what are we gonna do? We have 16 people left. And we said, we're gonna see 16 people. So the commissioners were kind enough to make sure that they, the door was left open so, that, or out, so they could get out. But we wanna make sure that we always hear from our constituents and we do the courthouse conferences. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm told we have time for two more questions. Again, we will go to Ohio Senate District 2, candidates Joel Odoricio and Teresa Gavaron. The question is, low-income Ohioans have been hit particularly hard by the COVID-19 crisis, with many facing homelessness, hunger, loss of transportation, and more. Many families have lost their jobs and found work at lower wages. What action can be taken, can the state legislature take to help these families as they recover both in terms of their health and their financial stability. Uh, first responder will be Joel Odoricio. This has been a particularly challenging issue for me to watch. Uh, we know that uh, at the beginning of this crisis, entire swaths of workers were put out of work immediately. 
Um, we had some help from the federal government at that time, uh, but that help has since lapsed. Uh, there was a moratorium on evictions, uh, but there was no financial aid to help people pay the rent. So right now we're, we're at, the cr at the beginning of a housing crisis here in the state. One in four renters uh, are behind on their rent and were not able to pay rent last month. Those people are gonna be evicted and they don't have any, uh, no hope moving forward. If you're out of work, you don't have enough food, you don't have enough money to pay that rent. One in four renters here in Ohio. So we also know that um, uh, one in five kids in Ohio has fat, had food insecurity over this crisis. So I can't believe as a compassionate person that we've allowed that to happen in our state. We owe it to ourselves to invest in the people that, in our community. So, uh, and you know, we haven't even really talked about landlords. My brother-in-law rents houses. He's not interested in evicting people, but he also can't have a quarter of the people living in his houses not pay rent. So what are we doing for, what are we doing for landlords? What are we doing for tenants? What are we doing for kids? We have to invest in our community. Thank you. Uh, Teresa Gavarone, would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Low-income Ohioans have been hit particularly hard by the COVID-19 crisis, with many facing homelessness, hunger, loss of transportation, and more. Many families have lost their jobs and found work at lower wages. What action can the state legislature take to help these families as they recover, both in terms of their health and their financial stability? Thank you. Um, COVID-19 has, uh, has been just awful. Actually, I recently lost a family member in Florida to COVID-19. And um, through that and being a business owner in town, I understand the impact. I understand it firsthand. Um, this has hit people on so many different levels. I've spoken to parents. I've spoken to teachers. I've spoken to students. I've spoken to employers and tenants and business owners who are trying to make ends meet. And we've, uh, our office has connected people to resources, trying to make sure we've worked uh, actually extensively with uh, Congressman Latta's office, uh, coordinating the federal funding and the, and the state funding to try and help people in need to make sure that they can stay in their homes and that their businesses stay open and they can pay their employees and making sure people are, who are out of work are getting the unemployment benefits that they're entitled to. This is an unprecedented time, and we're gonna continue doing what we can to help the people, not just of the second Senate district, but the people of Ohio, get through this on the other end and come back stronger. Thank you. The next question will be for Ohio House of Representatives, District 3, candidates Laurel Johnson and Haraz Ganbari. A violent hate crime happened in Bowling Green last year, and other incidents of discriminatory behavior occurred in the third district, including Perrysburg, which deeply affected our communities. How would you work with affected communities to update and enhance hate crime laws in the state of Ohio? Laurel Johnson. Um, thank you. Um, first, um, I believe that we need to come together as not only just a state, but also as a country and acknowledge that racism is a public health issue. Um, we've seen all kinds of attacks, hate crimes being committed across the country. Um, we've had, unfortunately, leadership um, by our president that's all but encouraged um, people's impulses, I, I suppose, to act on their, their racism and their hatred by committing these violent acts. Um, I think the best course of action would be to um, intensify punishment for hate crimes um, and also uh, working with communities to hold 
hold town halls in a sense to to listen to um, people of color and the stories that they have in experiencing racism, um, not just in the form of hate crimes, but just as far as um, being discriminated against in various forms and being um, being called you know, racist names and racist terms being used against them in their day-to-day -day life, asking those communities what they need best from their leaders and um, implementing those policies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Haraz Ganbari. Would you like me to repeat the question? Please, thank you. A violent hate crime happened in Bowling Green last year and other incidents of discriminatory behavior occurred in the third district, including Perrysburg, which deeply affected our communities. How would you work with affected communities to update and enhance hate crime laws in the state of Ohio? So as the son of an immigrant from Iran, I've been on the receiving end of some of the slanderous tone that has been thrown around in our communities. I met with the folks from La Conexion regarding the uh, concerns here in Bowling Green. Matter of fact, I went and met with the homeowner in Perrysburg as well. Um, and worked to help get him a new garage uh, where part of his garage had been defaced with some very unacceptable terminology and words. When the protests started uh, to evolve around the country, um, I grew quite concerned. And so I took the time to go down and meet with a group of protesters for 40 minutes on the steps of the State House. And I did so without any media there because I really wanted to sit down and have an honest dialogue uh, with each of them to better understand uh, the challenges that they face and what can we do to come together to have uh, concrete solutions and to move forward. You know, my brother's African American and my, my brother-in-law's African American and I have uh, two mixed nieces. And so again, this hits quite uh, close to home for me. I had very long conversations with my brother-in-law as well and uh, folks I go to church with and folks here in the community a dialogue is very important. We must acknowledge what has happened in the past, but we cannot just hold on to the past. We also have to have an eye to the future. And that dialogue will help us get those next steps to achieving a society which is more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. We have now completed the uh, questions portion of our um, program this evening. Uh, we will begin, since it is about 8.30, to go through um, the candidate list and each candidate will be given two minutes to make a final statement. We'll begin on the end farther from me and work our way down. I, as you finish your two minutes, I will introduce the next speaker. So you can be preparing right now. Our first speaker will be Myron Duhart. Well, again, thank you for inviting me. It's certainly been a pleasure. Um, the one thing I will leave you with is don't forget about the judges. Uh, judges are extremely important. You are seeing that play out on the national scene with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so um, judges matter, and it's important that you know who the judges are. You do your research uh, and make sure that you choose a judge who is qualified and has the experience necessary. Uh, to do the job. I want to uh, say that uh, I have my experience uh, being on the Common Pleas Court for the past 10 years, my education, my commitment to the community, as well as my commitment to this country, I believe qualifies me for the 6th District Court of Appeals. And so, uh, again, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Charles Sulik. Uh, yes, I, I, uh, I agree that we all need to get out there and pay attention uh, to who the judges are on the ballot and that uh, I encourage you all to also to, to do your research and make sure that uh, the, the judges that we elect are not only experienced but also have uh, uh, the judicial philosophy that you believe that a judge should possess. Uh, again, I believe I, I'm running because I believe I have the experience for the job. Uh, as, a, as a litigation attorney at Eastman and Smith, I've had the opportunity uh, to advocate on behalf of clients in both trial and appellate courts. And then also at the Ohio Supreme Court, again, that's, that's really where I learned uh, what it takes to be an appellate court judge. Uh, that's where I had the opportunity to uh, learn how to analyze complex 
and novel legal issues. Uh, but again, I also think judicial philosophy is incredibly important to consider when you're voting a judge. Uh, and for me, I believe uh, that the judges should be committing, committed to making decisions based on the law. Uh, judges should be wanting to uphold the rule of law. Judges should support the Constitution and uh, follow it, not rewrite it. Uh, so I think that it's important that everyone consider uh, that when they, they go to vote for a judge. And I, again, I thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, thanks. Thank you. Next speaker will be Teresa Gavaron. Thank you very much. I'd like to start off again by thanking the League of Women Voters for putting on this forum tonight and all the work that went into setting this up in a socially distant and safe way. So um, thank you for, for all your work. And um, I'm State Senator Teresa Gavaron. And by now, you know I'm a mother of three and a, a small business owner here in Bowling Green. I served on Bowling Green City Council. I served in the Ohio House. I'm currently serving in the State Senate. I've also been an attorney for 26 years. And um, right now, in the unprecedented times we're in, experience matters. And uh, experience is important as we maneuver through and get to the other side of this. You may not realize, though, that I've been endorsed by the business groups, the NFIB, the Ohio Chamber, the Leadership Fund, also by the construction trades, the operating engineers, the carpenters, the IBEW, and more. And I've also been endorsed by Ohio's largest teachers organization, the OEA. And I've been endorsed because these groups know that I'm going to fight to keep Northern Ohio working. I know the law, I understand business, and I'm gonna fight for our schools. I have a track record of working in a bipartisan manner to get the job done, and that's what I'll continue doing as your state senator. Thank you. The next speaker will be Joel Odoricio. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I'm a parent and I'm an educator, and I'm a union organizer. I've never served in public office before, but I have served my community. I'm running for office because each year I see it getting harder and harder for my students to afford an education. I know that each year I lose students not because they're having trouble in school, but because they're having trouble paying for school. And it doesn't have to be this way. When I grew up here in Ohio, I went to Ohio State, in the 80s, Ohio covered 70% of the share of instruction for students in our state. Right now, Ohio covers about 20% of the share of instruction. That's, tw that's about $10,000 a year per student. It doesn't have to be that way. It has been better. I'm running because I, I want my kids to have the same opportunities that I had. I'm running because I believe that I, I know that we can make changes by working together. For the last 10 years, I've worked for the AAUP here at Bowling Green. We gathered together, we formed our chapter. We negotiated with the administration and we made benefits for everyone. Right now, Bowling Green is uh, the number three institution in the nation for teaching quality. We've moved faculty pay from near the bottom in Ohio up to the same as what our peers make across the state. We've done that by setting the priorities where they belong, the students and the people that make up our university. It's time for us as a state to set our priorities in the same way, the people that make up our community. We need to, uh, we need to refocus away from power and corruption, and we need to prioritize the people that make up our economy, the people of Ohio, and that's what I'm here to do. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Corey Spiewick. Thank you. We've heard how much uh, the, the importance of the Supreme Court matters, but the Common Pleas Court in Wood County will likely have a greater impact on each of our lives on a daily basis. The Court of Common Pleas hears the things that are most important to people in Wood County. Criminal matters, civil matters, family law matters, property matters. We've also heard tonight how much experience matters. I have the experience to be the judge of the Wood County Court of Common Pleas. As a current prosecutor and chief legal officer 
for five municipalities within the county. And as a former assistant prosecutor for the city of Perrysburg, I have personally been responsible for the prosecution of thousands of cases. I was the first prosecutor in the history of Perrysburg to convict someone in front of a jury of their peers for domestic violence. But in addition to criminal law, I'm an experienced litigator. I handle complex civil matters ranging from family and divorce law to real estate and, and other transactions. I've handled pipeline cases, I've handled other civil and real estate matters that affect our farmers, our property owners, and our business owners. <clears throat> I've even taken cases all the way to the United States Supreme Court. I'm admitted to practice in front of the United States Supreme Court because I handle complex cases. I'm also an experienced judicial officer. I sit as the magistrate in two courts in this county and decide people's innocence or guilt based on the evidence presented to me. I've experienced uh, education. I, education is important. I've presented to the Ohio Judicial College, so that is the organization that gives continuing education to judges. <clears throat> the experience matters because we need judges that can hit the ground running, and I can do that. I've got the experience to, sh to handle the tough issues. I've been shown to handle those issues without regard to bias or other things. Finally, in that, I'll support the Constitution. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Joel Kuhlman. Thank you. Um, I don't believe that any aspect of our lives uh, is more important to us than um, guaranteeing our freedoms in an effective court system. Um, our judiciary has the responsibility to ensure that law and order is maintained, uh, and they have to balance that need with our rights as uh, individuals um, to speak our minds, engage in uh, the exchange of ideas, talk about politics and social values. I believe the person that you vote for, for common police court judge, uh, should be able to resolve conflicts in the law when they present themselves. Um, I believe my uh, public service as a city council member here in Bowling Green, uh, as a Wood County Commissioner, uh, shows that when I've faced difficult decisions in the past, uh, I was able to arrive at a fair and reasonable solution. Um, as an attorney that's practiced in many areas of the law, and represented, uh, currently represent three municipalities as solicitor. Um, I have the experience to use that same ju uh, judgment that I demonstrated as an elected official uh, when I'm applying the law as a judge and uh, to protect the important tenets of the Constitution. I would respectfully ask you to vote Joel Coleman for Common Police Court Judge. Thank you. The next speaker will be Haraz Ganbari. My fellow citizens, thank you for spending a couple hours of your Sunday evening uh, with us to hear directly from us, uh, unfiltered, uh, about how we stand on issues. With, with just shy of two decades of military service, I turn on the evening news and quite, quite honestly, I'm concerned with the current state of law and order across our nation and even here in the great state of Ohio. To that end, I've spent more than 100 hours riding with our men and women in law enforcement. Recently graduated from the volunteer firefighter course here through Bowling Green State University's fire school to get a better sense of how I can continue to support our men and women in uniform, our law enforcement officers and our first responders, because I believe that the foundational requirement of your government is to provide for the safety and security of its citizens. So as we've heard about attracting economic development, investments in agriculture and education, it's paramount that we have a community where folks feel safe so that those investments can come so that we can reinvest in our infrastructures. To that end, I will do all I can to continue to fully fund our police departments and our first responders. Uh, but simultaneously, I've also been part of a working group uh, meeting with faith-based communities, law enforcement officials, the unions, and others across the state of Ohio to address some of the grave concerns that some isolated law enforcement officers have uh, made and decisions they have made that have impacted our communities. So there's two sides to that coin, and that's why it's important that we continue to listen and learn and engage in that dialogue. 
I'm honored uh, by the endorsement of the Fraternal Order of the Police, the Ohio Association of Professional Firefighters, our skilled trades, and more than 20 other endorsements. And I continue to pledge that I will serve you each and every day, and I respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Laurel Johnson. Thank you. Um, thank you again for having this forum for you know, the voters of Wood County. Um, I'd like to share a little bit about why I'm running for office um, in Ohio's third house district. Um, I'm running because for the past decade, we've seen and suffered through Republican leadership at the state level that has um, largely ignored the problems of people and um, has served an agenda over serving the folks of Ohio. Um, I'm running to serve as an honest voice for the people of Wood County and for our district. I'm running to serve my family, friends, and neighbors and support their efforts in living out the Ohio promise. And what that means is that everybody, and I mean every single person in Ohio, no matter where you come from or what what qualities you have about you um, deserves to live, work, and retire in the state of Ohio securely and safely. Um, I'm, I'm running to truly listen to the struggles that people in our community face, the same struggles that I myself have experienced as a Wood County resident. Um, some of those include living paycheck to paycheck while working multiple low-wage jobs. Um, I've had to make the difficult decision between which necessities I could afford and which ones would simply have to wait. Um, I and other LGBTQ members of our community have faced discrimination in securing housing and employment. Um, I've also had my reproductive rights attacked by the state. And as your representative, I will commit to supporting, strengthening our public education. That means funding them. Um, um, expanding access to quality health care for everyone and ensuring that our natural resources are protected and our environment is protected at all costs for future generations. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Mark Vasilishin. Thank you. Uh, I am very honored to be the longest serving sheriff in the history of Wood County. We are the only country in the world that elects the chief law enforcement officer so I have 131,000 bosses. I work directly for the people, and I take that very, very seriously. I carry out my duties with the assistance of all of my deputies, and I'm very, very proud of the dedicated, hardworking deputies that I have working for me. For example, our jail, which I'm responsible for, uh, for the last, every year I've been sheriff, for the last 15 years, the Bureau of Adult Detention does an inspection. We have received 100% compliance from the Bureau of Adult Detention all 15 years. So far this year, and again, this could change tonight, but so far we have had zero known cases of COVID-19. And I give that credit to my captain, Rebecca McMonagall, and her deputies on following all of the health commissioner's guidelines and recommendations on how to deal with the inmates. And they have done a tremendous job. The COVID-19 has changed every aspect, every bureau, every division of my office and my deputies have gone with it 100 percent, been on board to make sure that we can continue serving everyone the best we can. I'm responsible for the county 911 system. We receive over 40,000 911 calls a year. The state did an audit the last three years. All three years we had the top marks. 99 percent of the 911 calls are answered within 10 seconds. The remaining 1 percent are answered within 20 seconds. I know of no other county that has a record like that. My rule is that all of my deputies must treat everyone with respect. We have a job to do, and I, don't, I tell them all the time, I don't care who you arrest, make sure you treat them with respect. Honesty and integrity is something I talk to every deputy when I'm, hi when I'm hiring them, reassigning them, promoting them. We must have honesty and integrity. Please vote for me. I have a lot of more work to do. We want to work on detoxing in the jails and also mental health in the jails. Thank you. Thank you. And the next speaker will be Ruth Babel Smith. Once again, thank you to the League of Women Voters for giving us this opportunity this evening. The citizens of Wood County have the right to feel safe in their homes. 
That is all the citizens of Wood County, not just the citizens that live in the north part of the county, not just the citizens who live in the Bowling Green area of the county, the entire county. I have been attending township meetings, village meetings, talking to the people of Wood County. The message I keep hearing is the same. They do not feel safe in their homes. Call goes into 911. The call is dispatched, and it takes 30 to 45 minutes for a deputy to respond. I wouldn't feel safe in my home either. Something has to change. Individuals are booked into the jail, have serious medical conditions. The answer, their blood pressure is taken and they're told to lay down and go to sleep. This is not ensuring the safety of the citizens of Wood County. Public safety is my number one concern. It doesn't matter if you live in the northern end of the county. It doesn't matter if you live in Bowling Green. If you live in Wood County, you are entitled to be safe in your home. And it is a duty of the sheriff's office to provide that security through the ways that they perform their duties to the citizenry. If I am elected to office, I can guarantee it's not going to be 30 to 45 minutes before a deputy responds. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Bruce Jeffers. I'd like to thank the League for this event. I'd also like to thank workers in the Board of Elections who are about to embark on a month of hard work and they're gonna do a great job, they're up to the task. I would like to thank my great-grandfather, Frank. He demonstrated that you can get involved in a community and you can make something amazing happen. He started the first farmers co-op in the state of Ohio 100 years ago. My other great-grandfather, George, was a county commissioner in Hancock County. So he also helped show me that it is possible to get involved and get things done. I think that my experience is gonna be very helpful in the commissioner's office. My experience as a teacher, working with kids, helping them learn how to solve problems. My experience as a negotiator for teacher contracts, which is another set of problems to be solved. And I look forward to bringing those types of experiences, background, and skills into county issues as we try to move forward. I think my experience in Bowling Green City Council is very important. I think we were able to foster smart growth while at the same time building uh, the largest solar field in Ohio. As a commissioner, I will be focusing on our hardworking families making sure that they have good jobs with a future to them. I want to make sure to work with farmers and cities to protect our natural resources. I want to be sure to work with mayors, councils, and trustees to make sure that everyone has a seat at the table. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Ted Bolas. Thank you to the uh, League of Women Voters and other sponsors that are responsible for this event. Thank you very much, sincerely. Um, I'm Dr. Ted Bullis and was elected to Wood County Commissioner in uh, 2016. Um, I've been practicing podiatric medicine and surgery for over 30 years in Perrysburg. Um, I served at the Wood County Board of Health for many years and was elected twice to the uh, Eastwood Board of Education. Before the effects of COVID-19, Wood County was ahead and setting records in economic growth, job creation, and sales tax revenue. We were doing very well. Two months after the first quarter, we took a dip, but we recovered in June of 2020. Uh, 20, 
And now we are equal to what we had in 2019 as far as um, our general fund and um, financial stability. July is even better than June, and we expect August to be even more substantial. So we're in good financial shape, and we're able to take care of our agencies. But in addition to these successes, I want you to know a little bit about myself personally. I tell the truth, and I'd rather solve problems than sit back and criticize others. When I see a problem, I ask questions, and I look for answers. I make decisions based on what's good for Wood County, regardless of the political party or ideology. I would like to talk in the future about Black Lives Matter. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Nick Rubando. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you to everyone who set up this amazing <laughs> event. Uh, just in case any of you all missed it from his somewhat meandering answer, Bob Latta did not commit to holding in-person town halls if he's re-elected. And we are at a crossroads here. We all know we need change in Washington. So we can keep going down the old path and keep re-electing people like Bob Latta, and he can keep taking hundreds of thousands of dollars from his corporate PACs, the exact same corporations that he's supposed to be regulating in Congress, so the oil and gas industry and the pharmaceutical industry, and he can keep not holding in-person town halls, and we can accept that. Or we can vote for change. We can invest in our era by creating 25 million new jobs with no new debt and no new taxes. We're talking about investing in infrastructure spending. So green alternative energy, new schools, new hospitals, universal broadband internet. We can invest in being champions for the environment, cleaning up the Maumee River and cleaning up Lake Erie. And we can offer universal health care Healthcare as a human right, eliminating co-pays, eliminating premiums, ensuring that we can drive down the cost of prescription drugs. I'm not a politician. I don't have my father's legacy to lean on. But I can promise you this, that I will work for working Ohioans. We might not agree on every single issue, but I promise you, when elected, I will always show up. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Bob Latta. Well, thanks very much, and thanks to the League for holding tonight's event. Greatly appreciate it. I also want to thank the voters of Wood County and the 5th Congressional District for allowing me to be out and representing them. Because one of the things I want to be is a true public servant. But let me tell you, I could not do this job if it wasn't for my wife and my daughters, because they permitted me to be able to do it. So I just want to say thank you, because this is a job that I love and put my heart in. You know, the 5th District is like a family. It's all a part of 14 counties. It's an impressive district that we live in. 60,000 manufacturing jobs, the largest farm income producing district in the state of Ohio. You know, we, we span across so many things. It's like a microcosm of this country. We have the, it's interesting in that we like things smaller in this area. The largest number of community banks, the largest number of community hospitals, the largest number of electric co-ops. It's incredible. We have the State University here at Bowling Green, which is my alma mater. We have four other private colleges and universities in our district, two community colleges. And one of the things I always tell folks is that I get to get, go out and meet and see so many people. And when I get to stand in the middle of a factory floor and take questions from those factory workers as to what's happening in America today, those are great questions. It's also when I talk to those people on the front lines at, the, at our hospitals, they hear the concerns because serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee, we have control over the health. It's important. And that's why over just the last eight years, I have done over 1,200 meetings in my district. I have got to hear from my constituents, and that's what I do. I spend my time in the car, and I go. It's important. 
And one of the other things I really want to point out that we have in our area, and I heard them flying over at church today, is the 180th Fighter Wing. Those men and women are there, and I tell you, I've been to so many uh, service uh, uh, meetings when they've flown out and when they've come home. We've got to th say thanks to them. We have a lot of work to do. Get, make sure our jobs and economies come back, that we defeat COVID, that we want to make sure that we have rural broadband out there, and we want to protect our supply chain. So thanks to the League, and thanks for all of you for being here tonight. Thanks. Thank you very much. I believe that concludes our program for this evening. And um, I thank you all for coming.